Okay, so this video is going to be a sum up of the lead up to the American Revolution. So this is going to start off with the French and Indian War. And this war is really a global conflict uh, that takes place a lot in North America, but then would expand outward from there once the fighting was done in North America. And before this war, France would really be considered probably the biggest threat to the American colonies simply as a result of their proximity in the New World and where they were. Uh, you're going to see a map here in a second, but really French territory and French forts blocked expansion of the British colonies westward, and you're going to see that here in a second. So this map that you can see right here is a map of what the New World looked like just about at the American Revolution in about 1750 here. So if you look in the south, you can still see the Spanish borderlands that we had previously talked about down here in the south. Um, you can see where my, my mouse is circling. And also the Spanish still owned Florida. In the middle of the country here, um, at least North America, you can see the blue is actually French territory. And then in the east, along the coast specifically, you have the 13 original colonies. And what happened is, as the colonies wanted to expand westward, they ran into the French along this border here, you can see the names of the forts, um, and Fort Duquesne would come into play, and same so would Fort Detroit, um, you know, a bit later in, in this story here. Um, but this is kind of that blocking that you can see by the French of the British going westward. So, as you got the arrival of the settlers from the Eng English, there really was nowhere for them as far as land goes, because there had been you know, a number of years now at this point that the British had been colonizing, and as a result there wasn't much land, so the newly arrived settlers really would want to push over the Appalachian Mountains and into French territory as a way of trying to make a life for themselves. So the Brits that did, many of them would ultimately try to pushed themselves into the fur trade with the Native Americans there uh, that had been the French's bread and butter for uh, a while since they had kind of moved into that territory. So that Ohio River Valley and the westward side of the Appalachians, which dumps actually into the Mississippi, uh, is really was really the major important link of the French territory here because they could get out to the Mississippi River and then ultimately into the Gulf of Mexico and they could ship out the goods um, from there. So this area is the Ohio River Valley, which I'm zooming into now, um, where my mouse is circling, which you can see with the key, and that's the Ohio River right there in blue. Um, you know, this is a very fertile land. It's really great farmland. Uh, it's it's really great for these settlers, and that's why it's going to be in contention with this war. So the Native Americans would have to choose their sides. It's called the French and Indian War, uh, mostly because the French would team up with particular groups of Native Americans to fight the British, as well as other different groups of Native Americans. Uh, and the Natives that had been in the Ohio River Valley uh, that were working with the French really didn't want to give up the land to Europeans, and the French had mostly been working with them and respecting the native lands, but as the English had kind of moved in and started to push over the Appalachian Mountains, which we had just been talking about, they kind of had mostly ignored the Indian rights, destroying the lands and getting in their way and kind of interrupting this Native American way of life. And as I said, you know, these tribes were going to be forced to take sides in this conflict. And in particular, the French would team up with the Huron and the Algonquin Indians, and the British or the English would team up with the Iroquois Indians, which would which had been kind of enemies with the Huron and Algonquin, which is why they would team up with the British. So the Seven Year War begins, which is another name for the French and Indian War, when a young George Washington is given an order to build a fort at the start of the Ohio River in 1755. 
And when he brings his group from Virginia out to this spot, he discovers that the French had actually gotten there first. And they had created Fort Duquesne, which if you remember from looking back at that map, I kind of had pointed out to you guys. So this leads to conflicts from the British with the French. And you get a conflict at this place called Fort Necessity, uh, which had been created to fight off the French. And the British get very badly defeated here and also in an assault on Fort Duquesne, uh, which if you remember from class, we had kind of looked at a primary source from George Washington. And this is where the British had significantly outnumbered the French, but the French with a surprise assault had kind of come in with the Native American group and were able to push out the British and actually badly defeat them, um, much to the British's chagrin. So after these initial conflicts and the British kind of not faring very well in this war, you have something that becomes known as the Albany Congress. And this is a meeting up in Albany uh, with a number of Iroquois chiefs in an attempt to secure an alliance with the Iroquois. Uh, the French had been working with the Huron and Algonquin, so naturally the British had really wanted to get involved with the Native American group because it was going to help bolster their numbers and help them with the war. And in this Congress, you actually also have Ben Franklin, um, and he's talking with the other delegates from the different colonies, and he actually suggests a creation of one government to be able to deal with this French threat, right? If you have this centralized authority and centralized power, they would be able to help make laws, uh, raise taxes, and kind of handle the militias and kind of handle the army as a central power to deal with this war. And all of the delegates actually at this conference, con um, Congress, actually felt it was a great idea. But when the delegates went home, you can actually, they actually did not agree. So the colonial assemblies, um, the governments of all the colonies, uh, basically flat out refused the proposal and they didn't really want to give up any of their actual local power um, to this central authority because they felt that this was not a good thing. And if you look here uh, at this little political cartoon. Uh, this is actually created by Ben Franklin himself, and he's saying that, you know, if you join together or you're going to die, they're going to basically split us apart, um, you know, individually if we don't come together here. So, as I was saying, you know, in the beginning of this war, the British really are not faring well. And this is kind of a reiteration of what I had said with George Washington earlier, where with General Braddock is defeated when he's assaulting at Fort Duquesne. And the British are heavily outnumbered, and they're defeated by this surprise attack from the French. And, you know, the next two years did not go at well for the British either. And the, the French would win important battles up in Lake Ontario at Fort Oswego, and they would also win up by Lake George uh, at Fort William Henry. So if you look down here on the map, you can kind of see where they're located. This is Albany right here. So this is the Hudson River where my mouse is moving right now. So Lake George is up farther here. So at the southern end of Lake George, you have Fort William Henry and then Fort Oswego. So this is all area where the French were kind of beating up on the British. And it takes those two years for a new person to come into the head of the British government in 1757, and his name is William Pitt. And he makes it a priority for the British to win this war in North America. And one of the ways that he does this is he actually promises to the colonists large amounts of monetary compensation for either serving in the military or actually for supplies from the colonists, right? The colonies, the whole point of them is to provide large numbers of supplies to the British. So all of these supplies that the colonies have, you know, lumber and all of these different tools for war, uh, they're already in the colonies. So there's no point in the British to ship them over to only then fight in the war. And it makes a lot more sense just to buy them from the colonists for the war effort. 
So that's what he's doing here. He's paying for the military service and also for the supplies from the colonists. And under his leadership, you kind of get this turning point in the war now. And you get wins at a place called Lewisburg and then actually at Duquesne again, which is modern Pittsburgh. I, I wonder why. But this guy's name is William Pitt. So you now have the North American War kind of falling, coming to an end. And in 1759, the British even have more success. Uh, they take forts at Ticonderoga and Niagara from the French. And you then have this Battle of Quebec where the British surprise the French. They climb up this cliff and they are able to get the upper hand on the 4,000 or so British that are, I'm um, sorry, the 4,000 or so French that are waiting there, and this battle ensues, and the British win the battle, and this is kind of the end of New France's territory and kind of control in this new world here. But because, as I was saying, this is kind of a global conflict here, the fighting extends past North America and back over to Europe, which is why it takes about another four years for the British and the French to actually sign a treaty to mark the end of this conflict. And they sign this first Treaty of Paris, which formally ends the French power in North America, and it forces France to give up the land east of the Mississippi, and up in Canada to the British. So you can kind of see that on this map that I'm circling right here, which I'll zoom in on in a second. And Spain, who had joined in on the war effort as a British ally, ally later in the war, um, was actually given the land west of the Mississippi for their help. And the British actually would trade um, that land or part of that land for Florida. So now when you zoom in on this map, and sorry it's a little blurry, but you can see distinct patterns here now of where the territory is. So completely east of the Mississippi River is British territory, and completely west of the Mississippi you have Spanish territory. So you will now have kind of clashes with the Native Americans. Um, with the French gone, the British colonists would head over the Appalachian Mountains and really begin to claim this land completely for themselves. And you have Lord Jeffrey Amherst, uh, which will t try to take advantage of the Native Americans by raising the prices for their trading, um, and also just giving the British the permission to settle in these Indian lands. And as a result, you get a confederation formed by this man named Pontiac, who is really trying to band together these different groups of Native Americans to fight against the British moving into their territory. So you have Pontiac actually capture uh, the fort at Detroit from the British, and this really kind of stopped when the French signed the treaty. You know, the support from the French kind of died down, and this kind of stopped going well for Pontiac here. And as a result, you have the British kind of get, ups get worried, really, a little bit about the Native Americans to the West. And as a result of this war, you get something that is known as the Proclamation of 1763, which draws really a arbitrary line, an imaginary line, down the crest, the top of these Appalachian Mountains. And it really says that it's going to forbid the colonists from settling really in this area west of the Appalachian Mountains. And, you know, British, really, they moved in about 10,000 troops to try to enforce this proclamation, uh, you know, in the cities, um, all in the colonies as well. And this really angered many of the colonists and was mostly ignored. And when I zoom in here, you're going to see a little bit better where that line actually is. So, you know, this, this red line here, which I'm tracing with my mouse, is actually you know, this this line that the colonists were not supposed to settle beyond because the West here was known as Indian Territory because they didn't want to have to, any more scuffles really with the Native Americans. So, 
The Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War, whatever you'd like to call it, uh, had really been costly for the British, and it had cost them you know, quite a bit of money. And the British Prime Minister at this time, George Greenville, um, felt that the war had mostly been beneficial to the colonists themselves and the colonies. So as a way of trying to get some of this money back, they institute a tax um, with the Sugar Act in 1764, which places a tax on molasses. And molasses is a form of sugar that helps to create rum. And rum had been a valuable trade item in this triangular trade between North America, Britain, and Africa. And as a result of this tax, you get colonists beginning to smuggle a lot of this, um, of, of these goods that you're going to be seeing these acts and these taxes on. So, the colonists didn't like the Sugar Act uh, and the tax on molasses, and there was a lot of boycotts and a lot of protesting, and you ultimately get the British kind of say, okay, fine, you don't like the tax on molasses, we're going to create a different tax. And they pass this Stamp Act, which is happens in 1765, which places now taxes or duty on legal documents, on paper things. So such um, these documents, you know, include wills, diplomas, marriage papers, uh, newspapers are taxed, buying almanacs, playing cards, even dice, um, you know, all have, you have to pay this tax to receive. And Really, when you bought these things, the way it worked is you would receive a stamp on the documents. So if you look up here on the top, which I'm zooming into right now, if you look in, um, this is just an example of one of those stamps that you could see on these documents. Uh, this would prove that you had paid that tax. And if you look closely down here, you can see you know, the tax was one shilling. And you would get the oops, you would get the colonists again boycotting and protesting this act. They just don't want to be taxed um, for anything. And the British will again try something different. Um, it's a repealed, and you get something known as the Townshend Act. Uh, this takes place in about in May 1767, and these taxes now are being placed on glass, paper, paint, lead, tea, and things like that. Um, but the really the big thing that aggravated and made many of these colonists angry is this thing known as a writ of assistance. And what this basically does is allow the British to now inspect cargo from incoming ships into these harbors with really no reason. Uh, you know, it's just making sure that they're not smuggling. Uh, and this, the colonists feel this is a violation of their rights as Englishmen. And in order to kind of stick it to the British, they actually stop importing many of these goods altogether, really again trying to help repeal this act. But as you have more and more of these acts, uh, you get more and more protests and you get a little bit more angry um, of a reaction from the colonists and you have the hanging and burning of an effigy. And if you look here at the picture, which I'm zooming into again, if you look at the picture, um, this is just a artist rendering, artist depiction of the colonists uh, kind of getting ready to hang this effigy. And an effigy is basically a doll, um, a straw, or however it's put together, of a tax collector and some of these British officials in the colonies themselves. And it's basically, you know, saying to these people, don't mess with us. We're, we're not happy. Uh, and, you know, it's just a statement they don't they don't want them to mess with them don't tax us anymore we don't want it this is getting to be the point we're getting frustrated and get this is too much so um you now have the boston massacre i don't know why this one is different color um but anyway the boston massacre sorry this is super bright here um but you get the boston massacre in 1770 and with the proclamation line that we were talking about just before and this quartering act, you have a large number 
of British colonists that are actually being stuck in Boston and being forced to be housed by many of the citizens of Boston. Uh, you know, they have to provide housing, they have to provide bedding and candles and beverages and things like that to the soldiers that are stationed there in their houses. Uh, and two regiments of British soldiers are being stationed in Boston. And with the multiple different acts and the different taxes that had been going on, which we just spoke about, you have this anger toward the British soldiers being there. And on this night of March 5th in 1770, you have a provocation of British soldiers by the colonists. And the British, uh, in this classic story, they open fire on these colonists. They kill five of them. Uh, you get major protests in this, this bloody massacre. And if you look at this picture, this is propaganda that is used after the fact. Uh, you know, if you look up in the top, I know it's kind of blurry, but it says the bloody massacre. And this is something that is pushed out to all of the colonies, kind of trying to show what had happened in Boston. And it's really trying to, you know, exaggerate what exactly happened, trying to anger the many different colonists, trying to get them involved and get them angry enough to do something about it. So, as a response, uh, a couple of years later, you have this Tea Act and the you no know, the Boston Tea Party, and this tax on tea, uh, known as the Tea Act, also forces the tea merchants to sell directly to the colonists. Uh, so kind of taking out the colonist middlemen, uh, this British East India Trading Company. Um, they're trying to sell the tea directly to the colonists to, and actually makes the tea cheaper. But because they take out this colonist middleman who was selling the tea and it's coming from the British, the colonists, of course, are not amused and they, they protest this and you have this famous act of resistance known as the Boston Tea Party which occurs on December 16th in 1773 which this group known as the Sons of Liberty boards these British ships and dumps uh, you know a couple million dollars equivalent of tea today into the harbor and Britain, the Britain now is is really getting frustrated and really annoyed with the colonists, and they now attempt to they take punitive measures. They punish the colonists, which something be, that becomes known as the Intolerable Acts. And the Intolerable Acts, um, you have four different really provisions here uh, that we're going to talk about, and the first one is shutting down the port of Boston completely, no one in, no one out, until this price of the tea is repaid. And in addition, they actually forbid the Massachusetts colonists from holding town meetings uh, more than once a year, and in order to have it to begin with, they they require the governor's permission at the time. And another thing that really angers the colonists is that the British officials that had been in the, the colonies and kind of causing problems for the colonists the way they saw it anyway, um, would not be tried for their actions in the New World in America. They would actually be brought home to Britain or up into British Canada, and that's where they would be tried for their acts. Um, things like the Boston Massacre, uh, you know, they, the colonists are basically saying they're getting away with murder here because they're being tried by a jury of their peers, um, you know, that are is a bit more biased toward them. And then lastly, you have this quartering act, this new quartering act, which again forces the and reinforces the idea that the colonists have to provide housing for the soldiers in their homes. And last but not least, you have this thing known as this battles at Lexington and Concord. So this is the actual start of the hostilities of the American Revolution. And you have Great Britain, the British troops leaving Boston and they hear of this rebel group that actually has a cache of arms. I actually spelled cache wrong there. Um, the, this cache of arms of the colonists in Concord. And you get this famous ride of, of Paul Revere. You can read the poem. Um, and you get a group of 
Minutemen, militia men that are ready to go at a minute's notice, which is why they're known as Minutemen. Uh, they they stop the British on their way to Concord at this place called Lexington, and no one knows who does it, but you actually have a shot fired here, and when one is fired, it's like dominoes, and you know it gets pushed over. They get pushed over, and you now have fighting between the British and the colonial resistance. And this is obviously just a small group of Minutemen, and you have a larger, much larger group of Brit British soldiers here. And the Minutemen run away, and the British continue to Concord, but fortunately for the colonial resistance, you have the British stalled long enough here that they are able to actually remove these weapons from Concord. And you... Then get the British frustrated, and they actually go to return home, back to Boston. And on their way back to Boston, you have a battle again ensue from uh, you know a couple hundred Minutemen now versus these British. And they start assaulting the British, and the British are on their way home, back to Boston, and they're being attacked constantly by these Minutemen, basically all the way home. And you have 73 that are actually killed, and about 200 or so Brit British soldiers that are wounded by these Minutemen. Uh, and this is the start. You know, this 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 first shot that's fired at Lexington is known as the shot that's heard around the world because it is now the hostilities have started. This war is pretty much officially on, and this is going to be a major again sort of European and global conflict as they see it here, and it's going to kind of shape the world. Uh, you know, after this for for all the way through today.